initial inoculum in the child comes from mom's vaginal microbiome. And so even if the, if the pregnancy took hold and, and was stable to the end of the term, when the child is coming out, they're picking up the wrong flora. It becomes extremely critical for, for the health of the child. Welcome to Get Pregnant Naturally, where functional medicine and natural fertility solutions will help you get pregnant and have your baby. Hey everyone, I'm Sarah Clark, and my mission is to inspire, motivate, and empower you. Most of all, I want you to wake up. So with functional medicine, we can discover what causes infertility and eventually reverse the condition. Today, I'm welcoming Kieran Krishnan to the podcast, and we're digging into probiotics and your fertility. Kieran Krishnan is a research microbiologist and has been involved in the dietary supplement and nutrition market for the past 17 years. He comes from a strict research background, having spent several years with hands-on R&D in the fields of molecular medicine and microbiology at the University of Iowa. He left university research to take a position at the U.S. Business Development and Product Development Lead for Amino Enzyme USA. Amino is one of the world's largest suppliers of therapeutic enzymes used in the dietary supplement and pharmaceutical industries in North America. Kieran also established a clinical research organization where he designed and conducted dozens of human clinical trials and human nutrition. He's a co-founder and partner in New Science Trading, nutritional technology development and research marketing company in the U.S., dietary supplement and medical food markets. Most recently, Kieran is, an acting, is acting as the chief scientific officer at at Physicians Exclusive and Microbiome Labs. He's developed over 50 private label nutritional products for small to large brands in the global market. He's a frequent lecturer on the human microbiome at medical and nutritional conferences. He connects the popular monthly microbiome series webinars through the Rebel Health Tribe Group Practitioner Training Program and an expert guest on national radio and satellite radio and has been a guest speaker on several health summits as a microbiome expert. He's currently involved on nine novel human clinical trials on probiotics and the human microbiome. Kieran's also the scientific advisory board for five other companies in the industry, and Kieran offers extensive knowledge and practical application of the latest science on the human microbiome as it relates to health and wellness. Check out his website at microbiomelabs.com. And before we jump into today's show, don't forget to hit the subscribe button on iTunes or wherever you're listening to this to make sure you never miss an episode. Hey, Kieran, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Sarah. It's so great to be here with you. Yeah, awesome. So if you could share your journey and how you came to do this work. Yeah, so this is, you know, it, it fits me really well. I've, I've always been kind of a big science nerd. My mom is a medical doctor, and, and I remember always um, spending a lot of time in her clinics when I, was, when I lived in Malaysia and, and India. So I'd actually go into her clinics and kind of ask her all kinds of stuff. And sometimes she'd watch, she'd let me watch, watch her kind of stitch up people and so on. So I always knew I wanted to go into science. And then when I got to college, the first movie I saw, like on the first day of school, was this movie called Outbreak. Yeah, with Morgan Freeman and Dustin Hoffman, they were like chasing a virus <laughs> around, you know, trying to figure out what was going on. And a lot of the people that worked at the CDC that were kind of trying to figure out a cure to this viral outbreak were, were microbiologists. And I said, well, that's, that's what I want to do. That looks really cool. So I went and, um, and I registered for microbiology. And, and that's when I, that's how I kind of fell in love with the concept of, of bacteria and all of the amazing things they do. And so when I, when I learned about the onset of the human microbiome project, mm -hmm. that really was the first time that was a massive research um, undertaking to figure out the relationship between humans and bacteria. For the most part, prior to that, we thought of bacteria as bad things, right? Most people think about bacteria when they're thinking about infections and needing to kill 99.9% .9 of germs and hand sanitizers and antibiotics and all this stuff. And in, when you do research in microbiology, you actually utilize bacteria as tools to really get a lot of interesting biological things ac accomplished. And so it was a great you know, awakening for me that now we had this tool through the human microbiome research to really understand the impact of bacteria on human health and, and even just the basics of how our body functions. And so I jumped in with both feet and, um, and haven't looked back since. So I've been focused on the microbiome and how we can impact it with, with 
probiotics and other types of products and understanding what a healthy microbiome is and how it impacts uh, the body is, is kind of the big focus of where I've been spending the last about decade. Amazing. Could, could you just briefly take us through that human uh, microbiome project for anyone that hasn't heard about it? Yeah, so it was a, um, it's basically a large consortium study that was started by the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, which is based here in the U.S., which is the, probably the largest research institute in the world. The U.S. government actually invested about $147 million into the study, into the research project in the beginning, and involved over 200 researchers, more than 80 different research institutes across the world. And the whole idea was that in 2001, they finally sequenced the entire human genome, right? So when we sequenced the human genome, the, the hope was that we would find the cause of every disease that man suffers from. And the thing is, the idea was that the, for every disease that we suffer from, there was a gene that was defective that caused the disease. And also, we are incredibly complex creatures. And so they were expecting we would have uh, several hundred thousand functional genes in our chromosome. But as it turned out, we only had about 22,000 functional genes. So that was a fraction of what we estimated would be in the human genome because of all of the amazing biochemical functions that we conduct, um, how sophisticated we are as organisms. And then when you compare that to like a rice plant that has about 40,000 genes or an earthworm that has somewhere around 38,000 genes, we are half as cool as a rice plant <laughs> or an earthworm, right? When it comes to genetic material. And, it, and it's really mind-boggling because you think like, how is it that we are at the top of the food chain, at the top of the evolutionary ladder and contain half the genetic material as something as primitive as an earthworm. And that, so the end of the human genome project left a big question as to where are all our functionalities coming from? And, and that's when they started the human microbiome project because one of the suspicions was that perhaps all of these bacteria that live in and on us are providing functionality to us. And so as it turns out, we have over three and a half million microbial genes in our system that we actually use for day-to-day -day function. So more than 90, 95% of all of our biological function is coded for by bacterial DNA, not human DNA. So we are way more bacteria than we're human. And that was the, uh, one of the big um, initiators of the Human Microbiome Project was, okay, we really don't know anything about the bacteria that live in and on us and what role they play in our ability to function as a human. So we need to do this kind of global international project to start to number one, identify what lives in and on us. We didn't even know that, right? We knew a small portion of the, of the types of bacteria that live from stool sampling and so on. Uh, but we didn't, we had no idea the diversity and the structure of the microbiome inside our body. And we didn't know what lived on our skin and our urogenital tracts and our mm. upper respiratory tracts. And the most important thing is we didn't know what their association was with disease and health. And um, the project, the microbiome project, was initiated to figure that out. Awesome. Yeah. It's amazing with the bacteria. And here we are with all these hand sanitizers and trying to you know, disinfect ourselves. Meanwhile, we've got, we're one big bacteria. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're a massive bacteria farm, really, is what we are. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's almost like, you know, and we, and we know a lot of people will um, realize that human cells, which are what we call eukaryotic cells, are actually made up of a whole bunch of ancient bacteria cells, pleiotropic bacteria cells that have come together to create a eukaryotic cell, right? So just our cells, our cells that make up our entire human body are actually ancient bacteria. So we've been kind of put together and assembled by bacteria. And then now we realize that we're also controlled by bacteria. So really at the end of the day, we, we've got to, become a little bit more humble about who we are and how awesome we are when you realize that really what we are is like a vessel for bacteria. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and they've built this system and they control the system. Yeah. And then I guess as far as a, a probiotic, lots of talk about different probiotics and we should all take a probiotic. But so what's the, what are the benefits for 
conception and, and really why should we take a probiotic? Yeah. And within the, the realm of probiotics, there's so many different categories and types of probiotics. And there's also a huge amount of nonsense. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the things that I, I discovered, so the way I got into the probiotic side is I, I also have a research company that does clinical studies for, for supplement nutritional food companies. We also do product development and we develop new ingredients, new technologies. We were hired by a large multinational company about 10 years ago to study the probiotic market and, and look at the products on the shelf and figure out, you know, what is the scientific rationale behind how they are formulating the products you know, do we need 50 billion uh, CFUs a day? Do we need 20 strains, 15 strains? The claims are all over the place, right? So if you walk into any health food store, any store that sells probiotics, you'll find products with one strain at five, six billion. And then you'll find at the other spectrum, you'll find products with 30 strains and at 500 billion, you know, and everybody claims that their product's the best. Mm -hmm. And then you'll see products in the refrigerator and then you'll see products that are not refrigerated. Then you'll see products that have enteric coating and some that aren't enteric coated. So, you know, there's just a lot of stuff out there. And so they wanted us to look through and figure out what of that makes sense. And then what would we recommend as a probiotic? And basically in looking through all of that, we basically found that the vast majority of it is not based on any sort of scientific rationale. You know, there's no studies on a on, on probiotics that show that 50 billion is better than 10 billion or 100 billion is better than 50 billion, this whole escalating of dosing is purely based on marketing. So companies, when they want to come out with a probiotic product, they, they basically sit down uh, you know, in, a, in a meeting and they go, all right, how do we formulate this? And then they go, well, the competitor we're trying to outsell has 30 billion, so we want to go to 50 billion because that sounds better. Hmm. You know, that's basically the end stage of the rationale behind how these products are formulated. And then they'll go, well, they have 15 strains, so let's go with 17. And then they just throw a bunch of stuff together. Uh, and what we found was the vast majority of products we tested, we've tested 40 of the top selling probiotic products. The vast majority of them just die in the stomach anyway. Hmm. So they're not even making it through the gastric system. They're not making it through the bile salts and the upper GI. So they're not getting to the site of action where they can actually function as a probiotic. So that was a big issue for us. Um, and then, you know, when we were looking at, at, at the idea of probiotics, we said, we asked ourselves a simple question of where did our ancestors get their probiotics from, right? Because we know that we have this intimate relationship with bacteria and this kind of intimate relationship doesn't occur overnight. So there must be a significant amount of co-evolution throughout the course of human uh, development. And so our ancestors must have been getting bacteria from somewhere that, that was playing a role like a probiotic going in and protecting the gut and kind of making changes and improving their health and stimulating their immune system and so on. And, and so we looked, you know, and our ancestors clearly did not have refrigerated sections at health food stores or, right, or products with special capsules or wrapped in seaweed and all kinds of stuff that people are doing these days. They were basically smart enough to eat dirt, right? And so they did not sterilize their environment. They did not sterilize their food system. And so they consumed a lot of bacteria from the outside environment. And, and then as it turns out, there are small categories of bacteria that are present in the outside environment that also have the ability to survive through the gastric system and then get into the gut and create a real functional change that makes it act like a real positive probiotic. So that's, that's where we ended up is we went, we went to the outside environment. We, we looked at a lot of different categories of bacteria. The vast majority of bacteria in the environment will not act as probiotics because their job is in the environment. If you swallow them, they'll also die going through the gastric system. But as it turns out, there are like the, uh, these strains called bacillus endospores that have the capability of putting this awesome protective layer around themselves. It's a calcium uh, calcified protein coat, and that keeps them stable in the outside environment. That also keeps them stable as they pass through the harsh stomach pH, and then they can enter the gut alive. And when they enter into the gut, 
they start to make some really significant changes. So they kind of police the gut, which is really interesting. And, you know, nature has created these strains for us. We didn't have to do anything to them in order to, for them to have this capability. They naturally had it. We just had to be clever enough to identify them and, uh, you know, put them in a capsule. And these are spore-based ones. These are spore-based, yeah. And often people conflate spore and soil-based. Right. You'll hear a lot of stuff about soil-based organisms. Soil-based organisms in general are organisms that exist in the soil. And for the most part, their job is in the soil. Their job is to fix nitrogen for the roots of the plants, to break down plant matter or animal matter coming in. They you know, help mineralize. They do all of this kind of bioregeneration of the soil and so on. They don't do much of anything in the human gut. However, these spores, which are interesting, these are commensal organisms, meaning their home is the human gut but they use the environment as a vector to transfer from host to host because a huge percentage of the microbes that you have naturally living in your gut use the mother to child vector, right? So, so you get those bacteria as you're passing through the birth canal. Um, and if you didn't pass through the birth canal, um, you, will, you have a second chance of getting some of the good inoculum that's through breast milk. And, um, and then even skin to skin in close contact with mom and dad early on. Uh, but the rest of your life, you're exposed to the environment. And so there are commensal organisms that use the environment as a vector to get in. So that's where these specialized spore strains come from. They, do, they are present in the environment, but they're not considered soil-based because their home is not the soil. The, the gut is their home, really. And a lot of people, when they're when they're trying to get pregnant, obviously they're they're looking at taking a prenatal, and I don't think they think of taking a probiotics. Why would that be a good place to to start? Yeah, so if they're taking the right probiotic, so like the spore based probiotic, for example, we now know that estrogen, the amount of circulating estrogen, is is a paramount indicator of fertility, right? So uh, and and it does it in a couple different ways. So. Um, estrogen through its byproducts when it's deconjugated will actually increase the growth of certain strains of lactobacillus in the vaginal microbiome. So what, then I'll, I'll connect all of this to the gut in a second, mm-hmm. but, but the end product is the vaginal microbiome has five major lactobacillus strains that, that should be present and should be present at high levels. The, this is lactobacillus crispactus, lactobacillus inners, lactobacillus uh, gesseri, and, and gensi, and then ruteri as well. And so these are the predominant helpful, beneficial strains in the vaginal microbiome. When, when, a, when a woman does not have a predominance of these particular strains, she essentially has a vaginal dysbiosis. And a lot of times vaginal dysbiosis, it presents as bacterial vaginosis or chronic yeast infections and so on. Now we know BV, for example, bacterial vaginosis, doubles the risk of pregnancy loss. Right, so just having uh, bacterial vaginosis, a dysbiosis in vaginal flora, can actually double the pregnancy loss. It's actually five times higher risk for early preterm birth uh, if you have bacterial vaginosis. And 30% of women are estimated to have at least some degree of bacterial vaginosis. So it's it's not it's not hard to see why there's so much infertility issues because the vaginal microbiome that seems to be critical for fertility and also for maintaining the pregnancy is chronically dysfunctional because the gut is dysfunctional. So then the question is, how is the gut connected to the vaginal microbiome, Mm -hmm. right? So there's a constellation of bacteria within the gut and it's the the constellation of bacteria called estrobolome. So estrobolome are responsible for producing a really critical enzyme. The enzyme is called Mm beta-glucuronidase. So that beta-glucuronidase enzyme actually deconjugates estrogen that's produced by other parts of the microbiome. So your microbiome produces estrogen, but of course, so so does your endocrine system. So when your endocrine system and your your microbiome produces estrogen, the, the enzyme that is produced by this group of bacteria will deconjugate the estrogen into its active forms. This deconjugated estrogen will then be absorbed through the intestinal lining and enter the circulatory system. It is then carried 
to the vaginal mucosa through the circulatory system and then deposited at estrogen receptors in the vaginal mucosa. Now, when estrogen gets into the vaginal mucosa and binds to its, uh, its receptors in the vaginal mucosa, it releases glycogen. And when it releases glycogen, that feeds these key lactobacillus strains that I was talking about. Now, when these key lactobacillus strains start to grow, they are, of course, lactic acid producers. So they start acidifying the pH of the vaginal microbiome. As they start acidifying the pH of the vaginal microbiome, it actually kicks out E. coli and candida and all of these other unfavorable organisms that shouldn't be there, and it'll start to create this abundance of these key lactobacillus organisms. This entire system is dependent on deconjugating estrogen in the gut, and that deconjugation of estrogen in the gut is dependent on a diverse microbiome. So what we know from the impact of the microbiome on fertility and maintenance of pregnancies is if you have a low diversity in the microbiome, you have a lower rate of having a successful pregnancy because that low diversity in the microbiome will lead to lower levels of growth of the key lactobacillus strains in the vaginal microbiome. So that's how it's all connected in one big way. Yeah, so really, and then as far as the probiotic, then, so how often should people be, be taking the, I guess we can talk about dosing later, but yeah, let's, let's do that. So as far as the, and you know, it's interesting because I had uh, streptococcus and I had both my children with, through C-sections, and yeah. then they went on to have streptococcus because they got the bacteria off my skin, and then both of them have food sensitivities. So it's almost, and then I had, you know, also I had premature ovarian failure, first of all, but so I had both my kids with donor eggs, but so obviously something was going, I know what I had food sensitivities and I had gut infection, um, yeah. and candida and H. pylori, all that sort of stuff. And then, yeah, the, the kids got the, the bacteria on my skin the streptococcus and not, and not the beneficial bacteria coming through the, the birth canal there. Right. Yeah, that's one of the big issues, right? Because or if your vaginal microbiome is dysbiotic, mm -hmm. you will also have higher levels of E. coli, you'll have higher levels of fungus, and initial inoculum in the child comes from mom's vaginal microbiome. And so even if the, if the pregnancy took hold and, and was stable throughout through the, to the end of the term, when the child is coming out, they're picking up the wrong flora. So it becomes, it becomes extremely critical for, for the health of the child. Um, of course, even beyond the, the part about actually getting pregnant and, and holding on to the pregnancy. But once the child is born, it's, it's critical to the health of the child that mom's vaginal microbiome is in, in the perfect shape or at least in really good shape, because that'll dictate then the, the rest of the child, the, the risk factors for the child moving on the rest of their lives. And, and then the way an, a probiotic can impact all of this is one of the things we've been studying is how do you increase the diversity in the microbiome, right? Because that seems to be the paramount you know, effect that we need to achieve in order to have a healthy microbiome, healthy estrogen balance, healthy estrogen metabolism, and then healthy mucosal lining, and then of course healthy vaginal microbiome at the end of it all, is the, is the ability to have a diverse microbiome. And typically, if you look at increasing the diversity of the microbiome through probiotics with the idea of reseeding the microbiome with outside bacteria, you'd have to take a probiotic that has somewhere around 500 strains, right? Because the microbiome itself has somewhere around 1,000 to 2,000 strains in it. So, you know, let's say we want to increase the microbiome diversity by 20%, 30%, we'd be taking a product with two, 300 strains in it. And we'd have to know with some degree of certainty that those strains are surviving through the stomach and small bowel and actually getting into the, the large intestines and colonizing. And that's never been shown with any probiotic out there. No probiotic's ever been shown to increase the diversity of the microbiome. So when we were looking at these spores, we saw that these spores had the capability of going into the gut and actually reconditioning the environment. And we started to see microbial shifts with other strains that are already native to that person's microbiome. So we're going to be publishing a paper this year that shows that when you add the spores into the gut, within about three weeks, you almost, you almost double the diversity of the microbiome. Three weeks. 
in three weeks. Our study was three weeks long to see what the changes are. You also increase dramatically uh, growth of really key bacteria like Acromantia mucinophilia, Fecalum bacteria prosnitsi, Bifidobacter longum, several strains of Lactobacilli, all of these really important endogenous commensal bacteria start to grow at much higher levels just because the spores are there. You know, and so, and that's the beauty of it. It's like that nature has given us the answer to how, for how to increase the diversity of our microbiome and thus become more fertile and be able to propagate our species. And that kind of symbiotic relationship with these bacteria has existed for millennia. You know, and so, you know, we're, we're, that's what we're studying right now. We're looking at all of the amazing changes that these natural spores that our ancestors have been consuming for millions of years, how are they impacting our diversity? And then all of the things that diversity can impact as well. So, and then there's a couple other ways of increasing diversity for women as well. So taking the probiotic, uh, the spore-based probiotic will do it. No other probiotics have been shown to be able to increase diversity. Then the other thing is increasing the diversity of foods. So our ancestors, the anthropological studies have shown that our early ancestors consumed up to 600 different types of foods on an annual basis. And they also ate seasonally, right? Because they didn't have grocery stores and all those luxuries. So they had to eat what was in season or what was present at that time. And so they ate seasonally. They ate a huge variety of uh, fruits, vegetables, roots, tubers, meats, and so on. If you look at the average Westerner that eats well, quote unquote, they eat about 20 different types of foods. <clears throat> and the more variety you get in your diet, the more diversity you end up with in your microbiome. So that, that's another really important thing. So people should start looking and adding small amounts of different types of foods into their system. And one of the easiest ways to do that I always recommend to people is go to an ethnic grocery store. You know, we have near me that we have something called H Mart, which is like this massive Korean grocery store. And you go there you'll find roots and tubers and um, cabbages and squashes and all that that are different than the types that you typically get in, in our case in Whole Foods or our local stores. Um, and, and even though they're in the same family or category of vegetables, their structures, their carbohydrate structures are just different enough that they'll feed other bacteria uh, versus the, type, the types of vegetables you're used to eating. So we just add small amounts of those on a weekly basis into the diet to increase the diversity of diet. Then adding more seeds and nuts and things like that, all of those things feed slightly different groups of bacteria and that lends itself to more diversity. And another thing someone can do for diversity, and this is kind of counterintuitive, is not feed the bacteria. So intermittent fasting actually increases the diversity of the microbiome because there are certain groups of bacteria that tend to do really well when there's not a lot of food coming through. And so those types of bacteria are, and their growth is supported when you go through um, when you go through phases of being fasted versus fed. You know, we did an episode um, on the podcast episode. I think it's number nineteen. We talk about the keto diet and intermittent fasting. So that's one to check out. And it's interesting. I'm getting a a local organic food box that are fruits and vegetables that's delivered to me. And it's, it's interesting because I'm getting these vegetables and fruits. I'm like, what is that? <laughs> which, which is neat because a lot of times we end up right. <laughs> the same things, right? So it's like, oh, I had a purple, a purple pepper came in. I'm yep. like, oh, never seen a purple pepper and garlic scapes, which I'd got those years ago. And I was like, I don't even know what that is, but, but yeah. And you know, they're easy to cook with. So it's just that variety of, of these different, different foods to then, as you say, our ancestors are 600 and we're at 20. So, yeah. And what about uh, living herbs? Yeah. And, and that's, that's the thing. Say that again. What about what, what? What about living herbs? Like adding those to, as a probiotic is to help us with, with the, the microbiome. What's your take on those? Oh, um, on herbs itself? Like, um, yeah, like when you say living herbs, what do you mean by living? Yeah, like, uh, yeah I guess the... Oh, oh yeah. Sure. Are, yeah. Like cilantro or is it lemongrass? Like those kind of ones that are potentially good for, for your gut health? Yeah, rosemary and all of those. So one of the big benefits of all of those herbs is they tend to have uh, a lot of uh, polyphenols. And then, of course, they are, a lot of them also have uh, really strong antioxidants. 
And uh, one of the things you look at in, in the Mediterranean diet, for example, is they use a lot of rosemary and they use a lot of oregano and, and other herbs like that, that, that actually uh, dramatically reduces the oxidation during the cooking process. You know, when you look at, because a lot of people will say, well, if you, you shouldn't eat tomatoes because they have lectins in them. Mm -hmm. right? Lectins, you've heard that word, and that comes from the kind of seeds of the tomatoes. But in the Mediterranean diet, which is one of the healthiest diets in the world, and there's huge number of studies on it, they eat a lot of tomatoes all the time. So then how is it that it, the lectins in the tomatoes are okay for them, but it would be toxic to us? Well, as it turns out, when you look at the way they cook, they simmer for a long period of time. Right? So when they're making a tomato sauce, they actually simmer the tomato sauce, the tomatoes in the oil, in the olive oil, for a long period of time. They also use extra virgin olive oil that has a lot of antioxidant capability within it itself. But then they load it up with garlic and rosemary and, and thyme and oregano and things like that that are herbs with also very strong antioxidant qualities to them. So there, it completely removes the oxidation and the oxidative stress associated with the foods that they eat. Just the, the process of cooking and using any type of oil can really increase what we call lipid peroxide. So the oils get oxidized during the cooking process, and that can actually really harm the microbiome because they act as antimicrobials. So adding the herbs in actually prevents that uh, almost completely. So, you know, and, and like in, in India, where I come from, using a curcumin, turmeric and all that has the same kind of effect. Mm -hmm. And then as far as, okay, so we obviously want to make sure we choose a spore-based probiotic. I think people kind of get, because there's, we talked about this, there's so many different types of probiotics. And even if they're, so we only want to pick spore, anything else is, well, first of all, they could contain dairy or all kinds of other things that'll, that'll make potential gut infections worse. To right. Not even, to not even go there, really. <laughs> Yeah, and, and here's the scary thing about it. I mean, and, and we saw this in the testing we were doing when we were doing the research project for the company, but then University of California Davis published a study in 2015. Their microbiome research group took a bunch of products from California shelves uh, from the health food stores, and they bought some online as well, and they did full DNA sequencing on the strains that were in the capsule. And what they wanted to see is out of all the products that they tested, how many of the products had the right strains in the capsule compared to what was claimed on the label. Out of all the products they tested, only one product had the right strains in the capsule um, based on what was claimed on the label. Right? So one, all the rest of the products, 94% of the products they tested had different strains of bacteria in the capsule than what the companies were claiming on the label. So at the end of the day, you really don't even know what's in the products, right? And, and then the big problem to me is that the vast majority of probiotic products on the market don't do any studies on the finished formulation. And that's a big problem. So the ones that say clinically research, what they're saying is we found two or three or four strains that have some clinical studies on the individual strains, and then we're combining them. And then because of marketing, we're adding 10 other random strains, and then they're calling it clinically research. Well, you can't presume that if you take things that are studied separately and put them all together, that the, that the combination is beneficial. Right? That's, that's a huge scientific leap. And so when we do our studies, we're doing it on the finished formulation to ensure that this combination of strains has beneficial effect. And that's what we're seeing. So we're seeing huge reductions in inflammation. We're seeing dramatic increases in um, diversity and the regrowth of all of these key bacterial strains within the microbiome. And then the biggest thing is last year we published a paper for the first time showing a probiotic actually resolving leaky gut in as little as 30 days. Mm. And, we know, and we know leaky gut and the inflammation from leaky gut has an impact on hormone balance, has an impact on fertility, mood, and of course, you know, long-term health implications as well. Yeah, so what about, um, so how does a probiotic help with gut infections, so such as SIBO or C. difficile, parasites, candida? Yeah, if you can share with us about that one. Yeah, so, you know, one of the reasons these strains were actually commercialized and developed, and I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but the first time they were brought to market, it was done so by a couple of large pharmaceutical companies, Sanofi Aventis, for example, 
out of France and Germany. And it was launched in 1952 and 1958 for the treatment of dysentery. So their, their primary function to begin with was to treat infections in the gut. And those products, incidentally, are still on the market today. So it's been over 60 years, and they're still widely used uh, in the market even today. And, and the reason for that is because how, of how effective they are. So what's interesting about these strains is they, um, they can do something called competitive exclusion. Competitive exclusion is a, a, using a variety of techniques. Certain protective bacteria have the capability of using quorum sensing, which is a bacteria's way of reading other bacteria's signature, and, and finding and identifying harmful, overgrown, pathogenic, unfavorable bacteria. And then they'll go sit next to them, and they will compete with them for nutrients and space. They'll also produce up to 25 different antibiotics right in that little microenvironment to kill off those bad bacteria. So that's why they were so useful in, the, uh, in cases of dysentery and other gut infections. And, and the beauty of it is they do it in a, in a highly precise manner versus like an antibiotic or even a natural antimicrobial. Those things basically kill everything in the region. You know? And so they can, in fact, cause more damage in the long term than benefit. And so using these kind of probiotics that are kind of precision targeting the harmful bacteria. You mentioned SIBO, for example. We've, we've got, uh, there's a pu good published study showing one of the strains that we work with, Bacillus clausi, has the capability of identifying and actually reducing the overgrowth of bacteria in the small bowel. And it's fascinating to me that the, that the spores even know that these bacteria in the small bowel shouldn't be there and they're at too high numbers. And it helps the host by bringing those numbers down. And, and with, speaking of C. diff, we're actually doing a C. diff study right now at Cleveland Clinic because we had some preliminary data that showed to, it to be quite promising. Yeah, I think sort of people that come to us and we, we run the, uh, the GI map and if we find parasites or if we find, and typically we always find some sort of gut infection, and then people will either opt, and it's, it's, it's their own personal choice, but we just sort of give the pros and cons of both, of either you know using conventional medicine and going down the anti-parasitic route or antibiotics and versus, you know, we're going to recommend a more low, low and slow approach. Both sides will have probiotics, but I guess it's just, you may eradicate it faster with the antiparasitic or antiviral, but potentially then you're going to work on months of gut healing afterwards. So yeah, what's, what's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, to me, you know, I'm always in favor of using microbes to control other microbes um, because it's a lot more precise. So I would say the, the lower and slower approach with a very high dose of these types of competitive exclusion bacteria work the best. Because if you go in there with an atom bomb, like an, like an antiparasitic or an anti, uh, antibiotic, you're, you're basically destroying everything. Within about 12 hours, things start to grow back, but they already come back in a dysbiotic way. You know? And so it, it, becomes, it becomes really hard long-term to recover from even a single use of, of those types of uh, medications. Now, there are, of course, circumstances where you have to use them, and we would never tell somebody that, that has been recommended or prescribed that by their doctor not to do that. Mm -hmm. That's between them and their doctor. But the study showed that, you know, even a seven-day course of clindamycin, which is a, a fairly common and, and you know, not as powerful antibiotic as something as like Cipro, can take the body up to two years to recover from, mm -hmm. you know, because of the mic microbial damage. So I would say going low dose, slow with, with antimicrobials, antiparasitics, but then going much higher with competitive exclusion bacteria that actually have the capability to do a, a precision target removal of these problematic uh, organisms. Okay. Yeah, and we'll talk a little bit about dosing at the end here. And as far as, so a lot of people that come to see us, they have, potentially they could have some autoimmunity going on. And so what's the connection between that and gut health? Yeah. So, you know, more and more we're finding out that um, leaky gut and the inflammation that, that is associated with the dysbiotic gut is a major driver, if not 
the trigger in many cases to start the autoimmune process. We know, for example, that LPS, uh, the lipopolysaccharide, the bacterial endotoxin that can migrate from the lumen of the intestines through the intestinal lining into the circulatory system and end up in places like your knees, your brains, your tissue, in the peripheral tissue all over the place can trigger an inflammatory innate immune response wherever it settles in. And then that inflammatory innate response can inadvertently can turn into an autoimmune response because of something called a bystander effect. So the tissue around where that toxin is found basically keeps getting attacked by the immune system. And then your immune system mistakenly starts to identify your own tissue in that area as being problematic. We also know that the vast majority of autoimmune diseases can have a bacterial or viral cross-reactivity. You know, so the the it's well established that Epstein Barr, cytomegalovirus, all of these types of chronic viral infections have a cross-reactivity with certain autoimmune antibodies. So they basically um, mimic some aspect of your body in order to trick your immune system. And that's, a, that's something called molecular mimicry, where you know, in order for the virus to evade immune detection, they produce proteins that actually look like some component of your body, like your myocardial tissue or some part of your brain or your joints. And then your immune system gets focused on that rather than identifying the virus. So that molecular mimicry portion is driven by chronic infections or infections that cannot be sequestered appropriately by the immune system. And we know that 80% plus of the immune system function starts in the gut. Right. You know, and so leaky gut to me is probably one of the biggest drivers of autoimmune disease because we can all have a tendency towards autoimmune disease, but it will never manifest itself unless there are three major components. One is a genetic predisposition, which many people do, do have a genetic predisposition because there are certain SNPs, that, which are single nucleotide polymorphisms, so little mutations in parts of the immune system that make you have a higher tendency towards an autoimmune disease, but then you still need a dysbiotic gut, a leaky gut, and then an environmental trigger. And the environmental trigger can often be, you know, an illness, it can be a toxin exposure, it can be a severe allergic reaction to something. Any of those things can start triggering a massive immune movement in the inflammatory route, and that can start causing the, down, the downstream effects that lead to autoimmunity. So the gut plays a central role in all of that. Yeah, it's really lifestyle, diet, environmental toxins, things like that can either turn on or off disease. And yep. um, yeah, and it's really, it's like when we do our, our health history, we ask people, well, before you were feeling so rotten, what, you know, what happened? And sometimes it's a car accident. It could be a, a death of a parent, a, a huge stress or, you know, things like that. And then it could be, then it could trigger something. Yeah, absolutely. And, and here's the beauty of it. The immune system has a regulatory department that is supposed to control and suppress these types of unfavorable immune responses, like autoimmune responses or allergic responses that are not useful for the host, you know, like having uh, IgG severe allergy towards food particles or environmental components. And that is called the T regulatory system. The T regulatory system has T reg cells that basically survey the immune system and survey your immune responses and then suppress the unfavorable ones. The thing is, the T reg cells are dependent highly on the presence of a really good, diverse flora within the gut in order to be, to be upregulated. So, so the bacteria and all of the microbes in your gut are the ones that actually stimulate that regulatory department of the immune system. So when you have a dysbiotic, low diversity microbiota in the gut, you actually are suppressing the regulatory component of the immune system that helps control those kind of unfavorable responses. So that's just another route in which the gut and the microbiome plays a significant role in how our immune system works. Yeah, and that's to me why pushing ahead with another IOI, IVF, when you have potential an autoimmune issue, and first of all, infertility, it's like to yeah. back, the, to back the whole thing up and see what's happening instead of pushing forward with that, spending thousands and thousands of dollars, which potentially could just, you know, 
go 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 to either miscarriage or failed cycles and heartbreak. So it's really right. Yeah, to listen to your body. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so we talked about the uh, vaginal microbiome. So, so how do we keep it healthy? You know, a couple of things. Number one, it starts with focusing on the gut microbiome. Because if you don't have a healthy gut microbiome, you are not going to have a healthy vaginal microbiome. We know that. We know that the, the growth of the critical lactobacillus strains in the vaginal microbiome is driven by um, estrogen and estrogen metabolites that are uh, broken down in the gut and then uh, transport it to the vaginal mucosa through the blood system. So without a healthy gut microbiome and a diverse gut microbiome, you cannot have a healthy vaginal microbiome because the, the, the vagina has other organisms in it and you're constantly exposed to organisms from the skin and so on, right? So you've got streptococcus, staphylococcus, mm -hmm. all these types of organisms around the, the vaginal canal that will often get inside, of course, E. coli as well because of its proximity to, to, the, to the lower end of the bowel. And so you're always getting infiltration from other microorganisms who are just waiting for an opportunity to start taking over that flora. And so having that healthy gut, which is kind of the builds the roots for the healthy lactobacillus in the vagina will in the vaginal canal will actually be the critical thing in maintaining the flora. Now, beyond that, anything that disrupts the pH in the vaginal canal has a severe effect on the vaginal microflora. The healthy bacteria in the vaginal microflora like a low pH. They want the pH to be around 4.6, 4.4, or even in some cases lower. Things like you know, E. coli, streptococcus, yeast, they tend to increase the pH in the vaginal canal. Other things that tend to increase the pH are personal lubricants that people use. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that a lot of the personal lubricants on the market, I've worked now with uh, two universities on this that have been testing it, and basically every personal lubricant that they've tested on the market somehow destroys the vaginal microbiome. And so those are a problem. I wouldn't use coconut oil either. A lot of people will say, well, well I don't use personal lubricants, I use coconut oil. Well, coconut oil is a big problem as well because coconut oil has strong antimicrobial effects. Right, So the last thing you want to do is put an antimicrobial in there. And then the other issue is using you know, detergents and you know, personal care products that aren't clean, that have a lot of chemicals in them, have, have all types of antimicrobials and preservatives and all that in there. Uh, you know, most people don't know that you don't really have to sterilize your clothes when you wash them. So even using things like soap nuts, you know, which, is, which are actual nuts, you can buy on the internet, you can buy these little nuts. They're like, you can put five or six of them in a tiny little bag and throw it in your washer with hot, with warm or hot water. And it, and it washes your clothes perfectly clean without all of the, you know, strong chemicals and detergents and antimicrobials in there. And those things all, once they're on your clothes, will have an effect on the environment within the, within the vaginal microbiome. And then if you're having problems with the, with the, with the microbiota in there, then you know, sitting in chlorinated pools and things like that for extended periods of time will certainly have a problem as well. And so is there a lubricant that you do recommend? You know, we are actually working on one right now. So, and we're doing some studies on it. The other lubricant that we know, uh, and this is being studied by a university here in the U.S., that, that seems to really damage the vaginal microbiome are the ones that are used in the gynecological offices. Mm -hmm. Those commercial lubricants that they put on the speculum or the fingers when they're, when they're doing exams, those have devastating effects on the vaginal microbiome. So, you know, as people are um, having fertility issues and trying to get pregnant, they're going to visit the doctor a lot. Mm -hmm. um, all of those examinations actually cause more dysbiosis in the vaginal microbiome. And then, of course, reduce the risk for, um, for having successful pregnancies. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Uh, my recommendation so far, just from, from a scientific guess, and I can't say that we've tested this yet but, well, yet, but we are testing it right now. I would guess that MCT oil, okay. which is a medium chain triglyceride oil from coconut, so coconut oil, as I mentioned earlier, is not a good choice because they have these long chain triglycerides in the coconut oil that have strong antimicrobial effect. But MCT oil does not have the antimicrobial effect, but it's, it's, a, it's a good, safe, low oxidative 
uh, lubricant. And so I would recommend using that instead. And some people have talked about uh, extra virgin olive oil. Mm-hmm. In fact, I think that could be that could be better than the vast majority of lubricants out there. So that's that's another option as well. But at the end of the day, it comes down to the diversity in the gut microbiome as well that drives so much of that. Because even if you do something, you know, let's say you have a, a fun weekend and you're spending a lot of time in a in a chlorinated hot tub and you're not sleeping as well, you're exposed to more personal care products that really aren't that friendly for the vaginal microbiome. And so you disrupt the vaginal microbiome. The, the microbiome has a way of fixing itself if you put it in the right context, which means you got to provide it with the right tools and resources to be able to fix itself. And when, when it comes to the bacteria in the, in the vaginal canal, it is the um, estrogen metabolites from the gut that are the big, biggest driver of it. So it all really comes down to having a diverse, healthy gut microbiome. And the way you get a diverse, healthy gut microbiome is you know, utilizing the spore-based probiotics because we have a study that we're going to be submitting for publication this year that shows that adding the spores dramatically increases the diversity of the, of the gut microbiome. And then having diverse diet so increasing the types of foods and the number of foods that you eat on a regular basis. And it's just a small amount of a lot of different things. And then the last thing is even doing some intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting actually helps increase the diversity of the, of the gut microbiome. Those things will drive um, a healthy vaginal microbiome almost more than anything else. Yeah, and we also ask our clients to switch to their 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 um, feminine hygiene, so their their pads and tampons to because I think eighty five percent of tampons are sprayed with the glyphosate, so herbicide linked to infertility and a whole host of other things. So either yeah, switch, yeah the Diva Cup or the or um, a natural tampon or pad is definitely one of the first steps that we have our clients do. Um, yeah, absolutely. And so as far as dosing, how do we, how do we go about, so we uh, get, get the uh, spore-based probiotic, uh, Megaspore, what do we do? So we usually taper everybody up. The full dose of the product is two caps a day, taking it at the same time with any meal of the day. So you want to always take it with food or with a meal. Um, but we start everybody with um, as little as one capsule every other day for the first week or so. And that's to get their body used to it because when the spores go in, they will start to make changes within the microbiome. Particularly, they'll start killing off bad bacteria and unfavorable bacteria, yeast and so on. And so for some people, when that happens, they can experience like a die-off reaction you know, which can be cramping, bloating, discomfort, some loose stool. And so to minimize that, um, we taper people up. So it basically, it either negates it completely or uh, minimizes it dramatically. So we say start with one capsule every other day for the first week. After the first week, if everything feels good, then go to one capsule a day. Uh, For the next week, if everything feels good, then go to two capsules a day. Now, if you do know that you have an, an, a, some sort of infection, a parasite, um, and, you're, and you're looking at taking an antiparasitic or antibacterial or antibiotic of some sort, we oftentimes will bump up that dose during that course to two capsules twice a day for the period that you're taking those antimicrobials, antiparasitics, or antibiotics, because you need that, that additional support while the um, kind of the killing and the destruction is going on in order to support the regrowth of the good and favorable bacteria. So that's how we dose it during that time. Great. And as far as any websites or books or anything that you recommend for our listeners? You know, yeah, come to our our website is microbiomelabs.com. We have a blog and a research page that has um, just lots of interviews and webinars and uh, write-ups. And of course, you can see some of our publications, some of the research papers that we've uh, we've published. We've got hopefully a wealth of information Mm -hmm, on there. And, And if people search my name on YouTube, if they want to learn more about the microbiome and some of the aspects of immunology and diet and all that stuff associated with the microbiome. There's tons of videos on YouTube as well. So you just put in my name in, in the, uh, in, in YouTube search bar, you'll, you'll come up with a lot of stuff, but we're trying to make the microbiome labs uh, website be a, a really good go-to resource for a lot of things uh, associated with the microbiome. So, um, so that's a good place. Awesome. Awesome. And is there a success story you'd like to share about, um, 
Anything you think is appropriate? Yeah, in general, with, uh, with the yeah. microbiome, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Or if you have something with pregnancy or fertility, or if you want to just give a general one too, it's, it's good. Yeah, you know, we have so many actually. Um, uh, you know, I, I love being able to talk about these, but one in particular was actually a designer that used to work for us. She, she was one of our first uh, graphic designers when we started the company just over five years ago. And she, with the, with the husband that she was with at the time, which was, which was kind of a, a not very favorable relationship to begin with, was having a very, very hard time getting pregnant. And of course, she was also a patient of the of the clinic as well you know we started the company really out of my business partner tom bain's clinic here in glenview illinois so she was both a patient and our first designer that we were doing contract work with and she had trouble getting pregnant for a period of time and then she was able to kind of remove that toxic relationship actually and find somebody uh, better and so it seemed that her body was in a better position to to receive that ability to become pregnant but but we knew that her gut had a significant issue behind it because she had a lot of food sensitivities. She would get a lot of bloating and discomfort every time she ate. And understanding the connection between that and the health of the vaginal microflora and then, and then the connection between the vaginal microflora and fertility, we knew that until we fixed the gut that there would be very little chance of her getting pregnant. So she was still not getting pregnant with the new relationship. And then we started, we got the first batch of the spores and she was some, one of the first, I think hundred people that started taking it. And, and then I think it was within about six months of taking it, she started noticing a significant change in how her gut and body reacts to food things that she would never be able to eat before she could eat now. And then within a few months after that, finally got pregnant after, you know, trying for, three, four years before mm, that, wonderful. you know? So the, no, the moment she noticed changes in her gut and how her gut responded to food, then she started noticing, um, th- then of course she, she got pregnant right after that. Amazing, amazing. And um, so you have a free download here for our listeners called uh, the top seven ingredients in health foods that hurt your microbiome. And we'll drop a link in the show notes. Can you share a little bit of what, what they what it can expect with that? Yeah, you know what? What's interesting is consumers are making health choices and and trying to eat healthy. And a lot of times, when you eat healthy, the way companies are positioning food products as being healthy is purely based on label claim of things like the amount of sugar in there, uh, the amount of fat in there, the amount of calories in there. And then, of course, nowadays we're we're getting people trying to move more towards all natural, you know, organic and so on. But even within that realm, nobody's really considering the impact on the microbiome of these foods. So what we wanted to show is kind of help give them a starter guide on how to look for even health foods that contain ingredients that will actually hurt the microbiome. Mm -hmm. So even though you think you're making the healthy choice, anytime you consume something that hurts the microbiome, it impacts your overall health in a drastic way. Right, so this kind of gives them a um, guide to look for things on the label in in many health food products that we know impact the microbiome in a negative way, so they can make those smarter choices. Awesome! So we'll drop the link in the show notes, and definitely check out Microbiome Labs. So M I C R O B I O M E Labs dot com for more details. And thanks so much, uh, Kieran, for joining us. It's such a really super informative episode, and I appreciate your time. Absolutely. This has, been a, this has been an absolute pleasure. And thank you so much for having me. And, you know, I want to say I, I love participating in these kind of programs because to me, being able to empower people with, with, in, with the right information so that they can take the right steps and take their health into their own hands in large part is, is paramount to the future of healthcare and medicine. And so, you know, uh, someone like you putting together a program like this is, is a big service, I think, to the, to the general public. So, Thank you so much for having me and thank you for doing this. Awesome. Absolutely. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. Hey there, Sarah Clark here. So are you struggling to have your baby? First of all, please know that my heart goes out to you. I support couples worldwide who are struggling with infertility to conceive and have healthy babies. Women like Rita, who gave birth to her beautiful daughter after following my fertility coaching system. Or Danielle, who after two failed IUIs was able to get pregnant after a supercharger fertility discovery call with me. So here's how you get my help for free. 
So I offer a free supercharger fertility discovery call. And on that call, I'll create a plan with you that is going to help you fast track your success. So this call is not for everyone. And I'm really picky about who I get to speak with. And I have a strict but totally reasonable criteria that needs to be met in order for us to move forward. So here's who I can help. So first of all, you need to be able to explore your infertility diagnosis in a new light. So this offers for people who are open-minded, they're coachable, and if you can do that and want to double or triple your chances at the fertility clinic or get pregnant, awesome. So let's get on the phone and chat. Also, you must be an action taker. So someone who's committed to seeing results, you're able to follow directions. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to do anything bizarre. But if you're one of those people who like to consume a ton of information, but don't like to spend time implementing and seeing results, then the call's not really for you. So I only want to spend time with people who are genuinely committed to their own success. So just click on the link in the show notes and apply, or go to fabfertile, F-A-B-Fertile.com and click on the free consult. So it's a really short application that just tells you about your health, how long you've been trying to conceive, and how soon you'd like to be pregnant. So seriously, this is going to be the best time you've ever spent on your fertility. Looking forward to chatting. Talk soon. Thank you for listening to Get Pregnant Naturally. Seriously, it means the world to me that you're here. Make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can be notified of upcoming episodes. I'm excited to offer you a special gift. If you're a U.S. resident, text FERTILE to 345-345. You'll be prompted to enter your email address and you'll receive our fertility yoga download. In this 20-minute intro video, we focus on a calming and peaceful practice to connect back to your heart. These simple fertility yoga poses can help quiet negative thoughts make you feel more in control. Download it now and get started today. So for U.S. residents, text FERTILE, F-E-R-T-I-L-E, to 345-345. For non-U.S. residents, go to www.yogafreebie.com to access your special gift. That's www.yogafreebie.com. F-R-E-E-B-I-E dot com to access the free fertility yoga download. And I love this quote by Dr. Mark Hyman, medical director of the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine and chairman of the Institute for Functional Medicine. Functional medicine is medicine by cause, not by symptom. Functional medicine practitioners don't in fact treat disease. We treat your body's ecosystem. We get rid of the bad stuff, Put in the good stuff, and because your body is an intelligent system, it does the rest. Thanks for listening. Until next time.